Hello everyone, a very good morning and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to the daily Hindu news analysis. So let's begin the discussion by first taking a look at the topics we are going to discuss today. In today's newspaper, we have plenty of articles that are relevant for the exam. I have chosen 14 articles in total, 6 of them which are more relevant for the mains examination and will conduct a detailed analysis of these articles and we have 8 more articles that are more relevant for your prelims examination. So let's cover all these articles one by one in complete detail and all you have to do is support our initiatives by pressing that like button and also share these videos with other aspirants and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. So let's begin the discussion by looking at this important article on page number one. This article is relevant for Indian economy and as well as for governance. According to the article, the government of India has established a new committee, a new panel to review all NSO data. NSO, I hope you've heard about this organization. NSO stands for National Statistics Office. The National Statistical Office or the National Statistics Office. This organization was established in 2019 by merging two important statistics related institutions that is the NSSO, the National Sample Survey Office and the Central Statistical Office. See prior to 2019 these two institutions which deal with statistics, sample surveys etc. They would collect vital data from the field through field surveys and come out with various reports and indices etc. which is vital for governance and administration. In order to determine government policies, to implement government schemes and even to plan economic policies, certain valuable data has to be collected at the grassroots level. So we had institutions like the CSO, the Central Statistical Office, which was bringing out indices like the index of industrial production, the CPI, inflation levels in the country, etc. Even today, the CSO continues to do that. And NSSO, on the other hand, the National Sample Survey Office would conduct field level exercises on the ground, conducting these large field surveys to capture vital data, which would help in policy making, policy implementation, and in general, would help in administration and governance. In 2019, a major reform was introduced. These institutions were merged into the NSO, the National Statistical Office, that started functioning from 2019. This key institution functions under the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation. Please make a note of these important facts. The establishment of such a unified statistics office was actually recommended by the Rangarajan Commission back in 2000-2001. In fact, the Rangarajan Commission had also recommended the establishment of an autonomous commission called the National Statistical Commission of India, which would provide recommendations and overall guidance for various statistical exercises in the country and for various surveys in the country. In 2005, this autonomous body, the National Statistical Commission, was set up and the chairperson of this commission enjoys the status of a minister of state. And the members, they enjoy the status equivalent to the Secretary of Government of India. So it's quite a powerful body. If the chairperson and the members have to be removed, then the government has to follow a certain due process before removing the chairperson and the, and the members. There should be an inquiry led by the Supreme Court of India, following which the president can issue orders for removal of the chairperson or the members. This goes on to show that the security of tenure which has been granted to the commission highlights the autonomy of the institution and its role in guiding policy making and in aiding governance and administration because such data is extremely crucial and it should be as reliable as possible the data should be collected in a transparent manner the methodology which is used for these surveys and for these data collection exercises has to be proven. The methodology has to be well designed. The questionnaire which is prepared to 
elicit responses from the public and from various institutions has to be well designed. It has to be scientifically designed based on the latest principles in the field of statistics. So currently, with regard to such data and sample surveys, there has been a lot of criticism. There has been a lot of criticism that the data is not reliable, the data is not adequate and these surveys are throwing up inaccurate data. The methodology itself has come under repeated question, including by government institutions. So that is why the government has felt a need to carry out a major overhaul of the statistical activities in the country. So let's understand what changes will happen because of the establishment of this new committee. Now the government is establishing the Standing Committee on Statistics. This is the new panel which has been created and this new panel will act as an internal oversight mechanism for all survey exercises, data collection exercises for the union government. Essentially, all sample surveys and indices and the reports that are brought out by the NSO, it will abide by the recommendations of this new oversight committee, which is called the Standing Committee on Statistics. This new committee essentially replaces a previous committee called the Standing Committee on Economic Statistics, which had been earlier set up in 2019. When NSO was established by merging NSSO and CSO, a standing committee on economic statistics had been constituted. This committee was looking at only economic data sets. It was looking only at CPI inflation measurement, index of industrial production and other economic data sets, which are more crucial for the Indian economy and for economy based policy making. Other aspects of data collection, sample surveys, etc. were not under the purview of the Standing Committee on Economic Statistics. Now this committee will be replaced by a Standing Committee on Statistics, which has been given a broad jurisdiction covering all data exercises and survey exercises that will be led by the NSO. Is that clear? This change is being introduced because very serious questions had come up regarding the quality of data and the quality of surveys that were being conducted by the NSO. As I told you, the methodology, the questionnaire and the statistical models had been questioned repeatedly, including by the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council. The Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council, which is headed by Vivek Debroy, had questioned the quality of the data that these surveys and exercises were throwing up. So if you make policies based on unreliable data, then obviously the policies are going to fail. They may not reach the targeted beneficiaries or it might result in unnecessary expenditure for the government. So coming up with accurate, reliable data is extremely crucial in governance. That is the reason why the government is fine tuning the statistical process in the country by establishing the Standing Committee on Statistics. So going forward, it will look at all the survey exercises, all the data collection that is done by NSO and it will provide recommendations to ensure that the existing data gaps are plugged to aid policy making in the coming days. Is that clear? That is the big change which is happening and Pranob Sen will be the chairperson of this standing committee. He was the former chairman of the National Statistical Commission. He has been appointed as the chairperson of the Standing Committee on Statistics, which will contain 10 official members and four non-official members who are eminent academics, particularly in the field of statistics. The committee can have a maximum of 16 members. That is the composition of this committee. As of now, 14 members have been provided, 10 official and 4 non-official members who are eminent academicians and statisticians. But the maximum members the committee can have would be 16 and it will, it, it will be headed by Pranob Sen, the former chairperson of the National Statistical Commission. These are some key points you need to note down. It's a key reform which is being introduced in the field of statistics to improve data gathering and sample surveys in India. So let's move on to the next article. We have a column on page number 10 that refers to the topic of defamation. It gives us an opportunity to understand 
defamation laws in India. What is defamation? Why is the topic in news? And other legal constitutional aspects related to defamation. See, the topic is in news because politician Rahul Gandhi has been facing defamation charges in which he has been convicted by a sessions court in Gujarat. Now, since Rahul Gandhi is a sitting MP in the parliament, this conviction, which is a criminal offense, he has been convicted with criminal defamation, the two with maximum sentence. So he stands the possibility of getting disqualified as a legislator and he could be barred from contesting elections as well, according to the provisions of the Representation of People Act. Because convicted legislators under criminal charges cannot hold the seat and they cannot contest elections for six years. That is according to the disqualification procedure and norms that has been laid out under the Indian Constitution and according to the provisions of the Representation of the People Act. So Rahul Gandhi has approached the Gujarat High Court asking for relief. Rahul Gandhi has filed a petition urging for this conviction to be suspended, this order of conviction to be suspended so that he may not face disqualification because of the criminal defamation on, under which he has been convicted. So that is why the topic is in news. So let's understand what is defamation, what does the law say and what possibilities can come up in the ongoing case. Defamation is an act where a person makes allegations and false statements and brings up criticism against another individual or against a community or a group of people. Any such statements that are made with the intention to harm the reputation of the other person or of a community or of a company, when such statements are deliberately made with a false and negative intention, then such an act is called as defamation. Basically, you are trying to defame the other person or the other community or the company that you are targeting. Without any basis, if false allegations are made with the intention of harming the reputation of the other party, then this constitutes defamation under Indian law. There are two types of defamation. You have civil defamation and criminal defamation. This is recognized under Article 19 of the Indian Constitution as well. As you know, Article 19 is a fundamental right that guarantees the right to free speech and expression. But of course, it's not an absolute fundamental right. It comes with reasonable restrictions. So on your freedom of speech and expression, there are few reasonable restrictions which apply, which includes contempt of court. You can't exercise free speech and use that as a fundamental right to criticize the court without a basis or cast aspersions about the integrity of the court. Defamation is also a reasonable restriction. You can't use the fundamental right to free speech and expression to make false allegations against a person or a community or a company with the intention of harming their reputation, with the intention of defaming that person. And even incitement to offense is a reasonable ex restriction. You can't use right to free speech to instigate violence, riots and create law and order problems. These are constitutionally recognized reasonable restrictions under Article 19. So defamation can be of two types, civil and criminal. In case of civil defamation, the wrong which has been done can be settled with a monetary compensation, with an apology. It usually does not involve a jail term and it's more about extracting a correction and apology from the wrongdoer. Sometimes it might involve a component of penalties as well. But in case of criminal defamation, if it is established beyond reasonable doubt in a court of law that a person or a community of people have been targeted to harm their reputation, in such cases, penal provisions will apply, which includes the possibility of a jail term. And this is recognized under the CRPC, the Criminal Procedure Code. Is that clear? Now, this provision that is recognized under the Indian Constitution has been very controversial. It has been a debatable topic. Because 
the provision of defamation could be used to curb right to free speech. It is seen as a threat to Article 19, especially influential people, those who are in a position of authority and power. Right? There is always a concern that they can misuse the provisions of defamation and target their critics and opponents and sue them for defamation, thus restricting their right to free speech and expression, which is a violation of the fundamental right under Article 90. So concerns have always been expressed by activists and experts about the possible misuse of defamation laws. And this is the primary debate. If you look at various judgments of high courts and Supreme Court, defamation has been constitutionally upheld. Supreme Court has repeatedly ruled that defamation provision is constitutionally valid. It is a reasonable restriction on your fundamental right to free speech and expression. In fact, the Supreme Court has even interpreted that individuals have a right to their reputation as part of right to life and dignity and personal liberty. No other person can harm your reputation, can defame you without a valid basis. This is seen as a part of right to life and dignity under Article 21. So this has been the constitutional and legal position with regard to defamation. Now, if you look at Rahul Gandhi's case in particular, what happened was during the election rally, Mr. Rahul Gandhi, who was targeting Narendra Modi as part of political uh, accusations against each other. He said that all thieves have Modi as their surname. He was referring to a few economic offenders who also have the surname Modi. See, again, we are not getting into the politics of this. That is irrelevant to the examination. But however, understanding the premise of the case is relevant. Based on this statement that Rahul Gandhi had made, where he was indicating that Narendra Modi could also be a corrupt politician, this led to a defamation case against Rahul Gandhi because the petitioner claimed that Rahul Gandhi was collectively targeting the whole community, whoever have Modi as their surname. Since he didn't specifically refer to Narendra Modi or the Prime Minister, he was just generalizing. This has been interpreted by the petitioner that the whole collective group of people who have Modi as their surname have been accused, have been defamed. Their reputation has been harmed by Rahul Gandhi because he called all of them as thieves. That is the interpretation the petitioner made and approached the Sessions Court in Gujarat. The Sessions Court upheld the case. The Sessions Court ruled that Rahul Gandhi did refer to a group of people, a collection of people, all of whom have Modi as their surname and called them as thieves, which is a false accusation without any basis. So on this premise, the magistrate court convicted Rahul Gandhi as it constitutes defamation of an entire community, defamation of an entire group of people without a valid basis. Now Rahul Gandhi has approached the Gujarat High Court to get a stay order issued to suspend the order of conviction. This is a legal right. Orders that have been passed by a court can be stayed or suspended by higher courts and this is crucial for someone like Rahul Gandhi because he is a sitting MP. If the order is not stayed and if the criminal conviction goes ahead, Rahul Gandhi possibly stares at a jail term as well because he has been delivered with a maximum punishment and he could also potentially lose his Lok Sabha seat and he could be barred from contesting elections for six years according to the disqualification procedure in India. So this ruling has very serious implications for Indian democracy and Indian politics itself. Again, it's not about the party or it's not about the politician involved, right? It's about the broader implications of defamation law on Indian politics. Because politicians are known to target each other. They are known to defame each other. They are known to resort to such statements. It's not just one party or one leader. Almost every politician would do that. So where do you draw the line? Where do you draw the line between genuine criticism, which is a democratic right, and targeted defamation, which is an attempt to harm the reputation of the other politician? If this line is not clear, 
then those who are in influential positions can easily push such cases to target their critics and opponents. This could cripple the fundamental right to free speech. And when this is brought up against sitting legislators, and if this leads to disqualification proceedings and if they are barred from contesting elections, it will have even more dangerous consequences for the democracy. These are the questions that need to be addressed by the High Court and possibly by the Supreme Court as well as the case proceeds. Is that clear? This is what we take away from this important development. You should understand what is defamation, what's the constitutional provision under Article 19, the types of defamation which is recognized, and what happens if defamation proceedings are upheld against a sitting legislator? Is that clear? We should wait for more clarity from the Gujarat High Court. And if Rahul Gandhi were to appeal at the Supreme Court, even there, we might get some more clarity on this important issue. Now, let's move on to the next article from page number 11. We have an important column related to cyber security. This article deals with the topic of cloud storage and cloud security. Both are very important topics for your prelims and as well as for your mains. Because under the subject of internal security, cyber security is a very important topic. It's a small article. I'll just help you understand what exactly is cloud storage, why cloud security is important, and are there any cases where cloud security has been breached that affects India, and what can be done to improve cloud security. These are some basic points we need to cover. I'm sure many of you would have heard about the term cloud computing. Cloud computing, which involves cloud storage, is a reference to storage of data. This could be digital data of the users. It could be pictures, documents, video files, etc. When all of this data, if it is stored in off-site data centers, and if this data center is managed by a third party, then such a facility is called a cloud data center or a cloud storage facility. Let me simplify this with an example. Let's say all these are users of a particular social media application. Let's say Facebook. These are Facebook users. Now, they have all opened their accounts with Facebook, that is Meta right now. So the parent company, Meta, which runs this social media platform, that is Facebook, is storing and providing these services through its own servers. Correct? But a company like Meta or be it a large company or a small company, they might find it very difficult to invest in the massive data centers that are needed to store all the user data. Because users on any platform will be generating massive volumes of data. So if the company itself tries to build its own data center and store all the data, then the company's cost of operations will increase exponentially. Also, it is not seen as an efficient way of computing in, in today's world. So there are other third parties which provide common data centers. They provide for pooled storage, which could be shared between different entities and different companies, which have, which have hired their services. You have many popular cloud computing firms, right? From Amazon to Google and many others, Akamai, there are many, many companies which provide these data centers present around the world for a charge to other companies, to other platforms and customers. So various companies make use of these cloud data centers where the data center is maintained by the third party. They are responsible for setting up the physical data center, hosting the data, managing it, securing it. And the company which would have taken the services, they would simply be transacting the data while providing their services to the users. So the data centers which are hosting all the data on these cloud servers, they play a critical role in the entire internet. This brings down the cost of operations. It is more efficient. The cloud storage could be shared between multiple entities and organizations. 
and both the entities here have a responsibility as well to protect the user data be it the company with which the users are interacting be it a social media firm or some tech firm and the vendors who are providing cloud data centers both the entities are responsible for protecting the user data the personal user data now of late a lot of concerns have come up regarding cloud security security of these uh, data centers because there have been many breaches where personal user data has been leaked into the into the public domain for example recently on a telegram channel personal data of indian citizens including their aadhar numbers and aadhar cards were leaked through a breach from the covin portal that is used for covid 19 vaccination registrations according to a recent survey conducted by a cloud security firm 35% of the organizations in india have reported that their data was breached in a cloud environment because these organizations are not directly responsible for the data they would have outsourced data storage to a third party vendor the third party vendor providing the cloud services is responsible the problem is when sensitive data is being outsourced to a third party vendor for cloud storage the question comes up as to who is liable is it the company with which the user is interacting and taking a service or is it the cloud service provider according to this survey 68% of the businesses in india and 75% around the world have reported that 40% of the data that they are storing on cloud servers is sensitive meaning this is personal data if it is breached and leaked into the market this could be misused by cyber criminals it could be used for targeted cyber attacks that could compromise the identity and the financial security of the individuals they could use this for targeted phishing attacks and to steal information banking and credit card information and to loot money from people or even to steal identities as well so this is a very very delicate and sensitive issue as far as cyber security is concerned the question is who is liable is it the company with which the user is interacting or is it the third party who is providing the cloud data center the answer is very simple both the entities are equally responsible they are actually referred to as data fiduciaries they are the organizations and entities in between who are collecting user data storing it processing it and handling it the company like let's say meta is collecting user data and using it the third party vendors who have provided the data centers for cloud storage they are processing handling and storing the user data so obviously both the data fiduciaries are responsible here so they should provide for enhanced data encryption so that criminals cannot get hold of the sensitive information they should enhance the cyber security measures at these data centers and throughout the channel where user data is flowing through there should be end to end encryption and users as well should be more aware and they should take certain measures on their own for example frequently changing your passwords making use of two factor authentication for example where you receive a otp to provide a second authentication along with your password to log into your account then providing for a security question monitoring your accounts and transactions and messages for any suspicious activity these are some basic due diligences that can be exercised by the users as well so this is where governments have a responsibility to bring out a data protection law currently this is lacking in india india is yet to bring out a data protection law if you have a well designed data protection law then you can place obligations on all data fiduciaries to protect user data be it the companies themselves or the cloud service providers all of them could be obligated through a data protection law to protect the user data so that is the need of the r given the extent of breaches that are happening in cloud security and the risk it poses for cyber safety it's very important to bring out a data protection regime that places these mandatory obligations on all data fiduciaries
That is what we understand from this important column. Now moving on, we have another article on page number 12 related to Indian polity. It's related to the collegium system of appointment of judges. So let's talk about this topic in slight detail. I'm sure many of you would have heard about the collegium system of appointment of judges. Under the Indian constitution, we have a couple of articles. I want you guys to find out which articles that deals with appointment of judges to the Supreme Court and High Court. Please find out the, the number of the article and post that in the comments below. According to the Indian constitution, judges to higher judiciary, the Supreme Court and High Court, they are appointed according to this constitutionally laid out process. But the constitution is not exactly clear on what entirely is the process. Through the three judges case, the judiciary itself has come out with the appointment system. From 1970s to 1990s, during that period, there were three different cases, the first judges case, the second judges case and third judges case. Collectively, they are referred to as the three judges case. Through these cases, the Supreme Court brought out the collegium system of appointment of judges. Prior to this, the government was exercising this right. The president was the appointing authority. Of course, president was being advised by the council of ministers headed by the prime minister. So based on that, the president of India was appointing the judges. But this power of the government was taken away by the higher judiciary by creating the collegium system through the three judges cases. So by 1990s, the collegium system was firmly established. And this is a very controversial system of appointing judges. Because collegium system provided for a system where the judges are appointing themselves. Without any transparency, without any accountability, judges are seen to be appointing themselves in a very opaque system. For appointment to Supreme Court, you have a Supreme Court collegium headed by the Chief Justice of India along with four senior most judges of the Supreme Court. That is the composition of the Supreme Court's collegium. At the High Court also you have a collegium for appointment and transfers which consists of the incumbent Chief Justice of the High Court and two senior most judges of that particular court. So the collegium decides the appointment and transfer of judges to the higher judiciary. So when you have such an opaque system where judges are appointing themselves, the concern is that merit and integrity could get compromised. Since the system was not transparent, there was no accountability. There was always a question regarding the merit and integrity of the judges who were being appointed. Because there was no role for the government, no role for the parliament, the other key organs in a democracy. Right? The judiciary has strongly defended the collegium system in order to ensure the independence of the judiciary, which is part of the basic structure of the constitution. Having an independent judiciary, particularly with regard to appointments, is critical in a democracy. That is what ensures separation of powers and guarantees the autonomy of the, the key pillar of the democracy, which is the judiciary. The judiciary has defended the collegium system by saying that the executive and the legislature should not be interfering with the appointment process or else it will compromise the autonomy and independence of the judiciary. While this argument can be un understood from one side, the concern is that what about transparency and accountability? Whether the judges being appointed, is it based on merit? Is the collegium considering the integrity of the judges? Right? Is it considering seniority? There is no clarity on this as the system is very opaque. So collegium refers the names to the law ministry and the government will be bound to appoint them as judges. The law ministry at the maximum can send back the recommendation. But if the collegium reiterates the same names, then the government is bound to appoint them as judges by referring the names to the president of India. And finally, the president appoints these judges. So to undo this, the Modi government brought out a constitutional amendment and introduced NJAC in 2015. The National Judicial Appointments Commission was set up, which gave a role for the government as well, along with the Chief Justice of India and the higher judiciary to have a say in the appointment process of judges. But NJAC was declared as unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court took up this case and this was a case where the judiciary was judging itself. 
and it quashed the constitutional amendment, declared NJAC as unconstitutional and restored the collegium system. So since then there has always been concerns about the lack of transparency and the opaqueness in the collegium system. It has often led to a standoff between the judiciary, the collegium and the government. Many times the government has delayed the appointments. Since government is bound to accept the recommendations, but there is no deadline, time period prescribed, government usually sits on the names and prolongs the appointment process, thereby not filling the vacancies and leading to a standoff between the judiciary and the government. So this has always been a concern. But in the last few months, there is a positive change which has happened and that is what the article is referring to. The article is referring to the changes that have happened under the current Chief Justice D.Y. Chandrachud. The current Supreme Court Collegium, which is headed by Chief Justice of India D.Y. Chandrachud, has introduced a verifiable, transparent, accountable process for selecting and appointing judges. It is taking into account three important criteria, which includes the seniority of the judge, along with a thorough examination of the merit, performance and integrity of the candidates. The Collegium conducts a thorough examination of the previous rulings that have been passed by the judges. Before considering them for appointment, their entire career and track record is evaluated for their merit, for their integrity and for their performance. To see whether they have been unbiased, to see whether they have been independent and autonomous in their decision making and whether they have followed the norms of the constitution and the basic structure. Along with that, the Collegium has prioritized diversity and inclusion in the higher judiciary to ensure that judges from all backgrounds, all communities are represented within the judiciary. These three criteria have been used by the current Supreme Court Collegium which has brought about some positive change as far as the appointment of judges in our country is concerned. So that is what the article is talking about. Silently, the Collegium headed by Chief Justice Chandrachud has introduced few transparency measures which is driving a slight change in the process of appointing judges. Is that clear? Three important criteria are being considered. One is the seniority of the judge, merit and previous performance and integrity of the judge through a thorough examination of their previous performance and diversity and inclusion. So this is what you need to note from this important article. Next, on page number 12, we have an article related to disaster management. It's specifically related to lightning. Lightning in India is not officially considered as a natural disaster. Please make a note. Lightning is not a notified natural disaster in the country and the central government is opposed to notifying lightning as a natural disaster. So this has led to a standoff between the central government and the states. So we need to examine this issue in slight detail. It's very important for your prelims and even for your means. According to the article, the government of India is not in favor of notifying lightning as a natural disaster. I'll explain why. We'll look at both sides of the argument. What the center is saying, what the state governments are saying and what does the data show. If you look at the website of NDMA, the National Disaster Management Authority, and if you also go through the National Disaster Management Policy and Plan of India, that's been brought out by NDMA, it does look at lightning as one of the disasters. But officially, Government of India has not notified lightning as a disaster. Is that clear? Please note down this important point. Officially, lightning is not a notified disaster in India. Even though NDMA treats lightning as one of the natural disasters, similar to earthquakes, cyclones, floods, etc. Now, what will happen if a natural hazard is officially notified as a natural disaster? If it is notified, then the victims of that disaster, they can seek compensation under the State Disaster Response Fund which has been established through the Disaster Management Act of 2005. 
the victims of the disaster they become entitled to a compensation to be paid by the concerned state governments by drawing funds from the SDRF. Currently, this is not possible for state governments. They can't compensate the victims of lightning because lightning is not a notified disaster in the country. The center believes that there is no need to classify lightning as a disaster because according to the government of India, it can be prevented. The deaths, the deaths can be prevented. If not the hazard, lightning can't be prevented, right? The hazard cannot be prevented, but at least the deaths occurring from it, the disaster which is happening can be prevented through better awareness and better forecasting. Through better early warning and by sharing real-time alerts and forecasting and by spreading the right awareness, these lightning-related deaths in the country can be prevented according to the government of India. But the concern being expressed by state governments is that number of lightning-related deaths in our country has increased of late. In fact, you will be surprised to know that lightning accounts for a significant number of deaths in India and even around the world. It's like a silent killer. Most people dismiss the impact of lightning. But trust me, it has a very, very big impact. According to data brought out by the National Crime Records Bureau, 40% of accidental deaths caused by natural forces have occurred because of lightning. Look at that statistic. 40% of deaths occurring due to natural accidents, due to natural forces, is because of lightning in our country. Few states in particular are highly vulnerable. States like Bihar, West Bengal, Odisha, Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand, they are particularly vulnerable because of extreme weather events, which drives thunderstorms and lightning-related activity. Every year on an average, around 2,500 Indians are getting killed. And since 1967, more than 1 lakh people in India have died because of lightning. Now, this is a very, very big number. And yet, the government is looking to ignore it and not notify it as a disaster. I think now you can understand why state governments are pushing the center to notify lightning as a natural disaster. In Bihar, just in this year, in the last six to seven months, there have been 107 deaths. On 25th June 2020, it's a dark day in India's history. More than 100 people were killed in India because of lightning on a single day. So in a year on an average, we are losing 2,500 people according to official statistics. So it is necessary to classify this as a disaster according to state governments so that they can provide compensation to the victims from SDRF. Is that clear? See, SDRF is a fund which is available to the state government to provide for disaster relief when a disaster has occurred, to provide immediate relief and compensation to the victims, and also to fund the emergency operations needed, rescue operations during a disaster. 75% of this fund is contributed by the central government. Rest 25% comes from the states. Alright? So central component is more. So center is obviously concerned about the financial burden. The central government's argument is that India has very good early warning systems in place. In fact, India is one amongst the five countries in the world which have implemented an effective early warning forecasting system for lightnings. The IMD can provide very accurate lightning alerts at least few days prior or few hours prior. Accordingly, real-time alerts can be issued so that awareness can be spread amongst the people so that they can take adequate measures to ensure that they are not exposed to limit their exposure to these conditions. Especially at the grassroots at Panchayat level, Announcements are made, pamphlets are distributed to ensure that people don't venture out when the alerts are out and thereby protect lives. But usually in rural areas, farmers especially, manual laborers, they are forced to work in the open despite the alerts. And hence, number of lives are lost in the country. That's why state governments are under pressure. Since so many de deaths occur in the country, 
and it accounts for nearly 40% of disaster related deaths. States are pushing for its notification as a disaster so they can give compensation through SDRF. But the center is not agreeing to it. Center believes we have good early warning and forecasting and by spreading awareness and by giving real time alerts, we can prevent the deaths from happening. All right. The last point. Currently, the notified disasters are cyclones, droughts, earthquakes, floods, forest fire, industrial fire, tsunamis, hailstorms, landslides, avalanche, cloud burst, pest attack, frost and cold wave. These are the notified disasters. When they occur, compensation can be given to victims through SDRF funds. Is that clear? Please note down these key points for your prelims and also for your mains. Coming to the next article. On page 15, we have an article related to environment ecology and disaster management. It's more of a, a trend and an alert that you need to spot as far as climate change is concerned. According to this article, record level temperatures are being reported in several parts of the world. In North America, in Europe, in Asia, across the world, record temperatures are being reported and this is believed to be a result of climate change and also due to the El Nino weather phenomena which has kicked in. The warmer temperatures in the Pacific waters between Australia and Peru is already driving climatic and weather changes around the world and human induced climate change is contributing to more extreme weather events. Specifically in Japan, in Italy and in the US, especially in California. You might have heard about the Death Valley in California, which is one of the hottest places in on Earth. Across these places, heat wave and forest fire alerts have been issued. In fact, in the state of California, multiple forest fires have already broken out because of record level temperatures. Heat wave alerts have been issued across US from California to Texas to Florida. In Italy, Severe heat wave alerts have been given out even in few other European countries as well. In Japan, lot of heat stroke cases are being reported. So this is an indication of increasing extreme weather events, which could be a combination of climate change induced extreme weather events along with the El Nino phenomena. So that is the important trend that we need to spot from this article. So this completes my detailed discussion of all the big articles today. Now we head towards the prelim section where we have around eight small articles and we'll go through them quickly. On page number one, we have an economy related art article. India has pushed for a taxation proposal at the G20 to increase taxes on large corporates that are making massive profits. In fact, this is a proposal many countries have been pushing from many years. There are a few big companies like let's say Apple, Amazon, etc, which report billions and billions of dollars of profit. But quite often they off operate in low tax jurisdictions. And they enjoy the benefit of low taxes by operating in tax havens and low tax jurisdictions. So to prevent this loss of revenue, Many governments got together in 2021 and along with OECD, which is a organization in Europe for economic cooperation and development, a proposal was made for a global minimum corporate tax. This proposal was pushed by the United States, backed by India and many other countries. Almost 140 countries have supported this proposal to levy more taxes on large MNCs, multinational corporations and large corporates that are making a lot of profits. The proposal is to introduce a corporate tax of minimum 15% on large companies. This would be the minimum corporate tax which would create a new threshold around the world. It's supposed to be implemented from next year, from 2024. This was the deal that was worked out in 2021 under the leadership of the US. Back then, Donald Trump was the president and along with US, many countries gave a push for a global minimum corporate tax. So 15% is the minimum tax which has been agreed to with a 25% surcharge on excess profits. 
if companies make profits beyond a certain defined limit, then a 25% excess tax or sur surcharge tax will also be levied. This surcharge is to be distributed between different countries where the companies are operating. Generally, multinational companies, they have user base around the world. They operate in multiple countries. They gain revenue from multiple jurisdictions. But they pay taxes only in low tax jurisdictions, thereby depriving precious revenue to other governments. So to prevent this, a global minimum corporate tax has been agreed to in 2021. And India is pushing for its implementation at the upcoming G20 summit. Is that clear? So this is the development you should be aware of. Next, on page number one, we have a sports related article. Yes, UPSC being an unpredictable public service commission has surprised us with sports questions. This year, for example, we had three sports questions in prelims. In 2021 as well, there were three factual sports questions. At least the big sporting developments is something you should be aware of. And yesterday we witnessed a terrific match of tennis between upcoming tennis star Carlos Alcaraz of Spain, who defeated Novak Djokovic in a tightly fought match. I'm sure many tennis fans would have seen the match as well. Right? He has won the Wimbledon, which is a Grand Slam, and he has defeated one of the top players currently. Is that clear? So just remember the names. The facts are enough. Nothing to discuss here. Just remember that Carlos Alcaraz of Spain won this year's Wimbledon, which is a flagship Grand Slam event that takes place in UK. And he has defeated seven-time champion Novak Djokovic. Just the factual information is enough. Next, on page number four, we have an article related to environment and ecology. The article refers to the Hulock Gibbons that you can see in the image over here. Hulock Gibbons, they belong to the ape category and it's the only ape found in India. Please make a note of this point. The Hulock Gibbon is the only ape which is found in India. I hope you guys know that apes that represent a key link in human evolution consists of many different species and subspecies and amongst them the gibbons are the smallest and the fastest of all the apes. Gibbons are fi primarily found in tropical subtropical forests of Southeast Asia which extends to India and China as well. This is their primary habitat. Please make a note. Is that clear? Gibbons are mainly found in Southeast Asia, parts of India and China. Their habitat is primarily tropical, subtropical forests. And just like any other ape, gibbons are also very, very intelligent. They have very good cognitive skills and they actually bond very close personal bonds. Not just within the species, but with humans as well. The hulok gibbon is a threatened species. It's found in India. That's the only gibbon we have in India, the only ape in India. And currently it is facing a high risk of extinction. The IUCN has categorized it as endangered. And it has placed it on the risk of extinction because of habitat destruction. Habitat destruction is the biggest threat. These concerns were brought out recently at the Global Gibbon Network, which held a summit in China. There is a global initiative to conserve and protect the gibbon population called the Global Gibbon Network, which focuses on protecting gibbons and their habitats. And this summit which took place in China has raised concerns about the survival of the Hulok gibbon in India's Northeast region. All right, they are found in the Northeast region of India. Please make a note. Earlier, there was a wrong classification of the gibbons in India. It was believed by zoologists that we had two variants, the Eastern Hulok and the Western Hulok. This was a previous taxonomical understanding. It was understood that in Arunachal Pradesh, we have a subspecies of Hulok gibbon. It was named as Eastern Hulok gibbon. And in other Northeastern states like Manipur, Mizoram, Assam, etc. The subspecies of Hulok gibbon was named as the Western Hulok gibbon. They were believed to be of different genetic 
uh, lineage. But further genetic studies by the Center for Cellular and Molecular Biology from Hyderabad conclusively proved that these are not the two different subspecies. They are actually the same. Through genetic and molecular studies, CCB, CCMB from Hyderabad proved that this is a taxonomical mistake which had been made. This theory was debunked and since then there is only one Hulo gibbon species listed in India. You don't have the western and eastern subspecies anymore. They have been clubbed together as just the Hulo gibbon species in India. That's the only ape and gibbon we have in India which is endangered and facing the risk of extinction. Alright, so please make a note of these key points. Next, another similar article on page 6 related to a large insect or a cicada. Cicada refers to these large insects and the insect that you see here in the image. This was previously seen as a subspecies linked with a Malaysian variant. In Malaysia back in 1850 in the Borneo region where you have tropical uh, evergreen and subtropical forests. This species of the insect had been detected and taxonomically it had been listed where the cicada found in India, in southern India especially, in the western Ghats, was seen as a subspecies of the Malaysian species. This was the previous classification. Previously this cicada or this large insect which is found in southern India, in Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka etc. You find them usually in farmlands and also in uh, homesteads. That's where we find them in quite large numbers. And they were seen as a subspecies of the Malaysian species. And this was a wrong taxonomical classification. Recent research by Kerala based institution, the Travancore Nature History Society, has clearly proved that this is a different distinct subspecies rooted in India. The distinct lineage between the Malaysian subspecies and the Indian subspecies has been verified and established through this research. And now this has been listed as a distinct insect species. It's been named as Purana Chivida by drawing from its Malayalam name. Alright? So that is a development you should remember. And the important point is that their numbers are declining. And this is an indication of deteriorating soil quality and vegetation. It represents an environmental hazard. If the population of the Purana Chivida declines, it indicates that soil quality is getting affected and vegetation has been destroyed. That is when the numbers start declining. Alright, so please make a note. Next, another small development from IR. India and Mongolia have started their military exercise which is named as nomadic elephant. Nomadic elephant is the name of an annual joint military exercise between Indian army and the Mongolian army. As you know Mongolia is the northern neighbor of China and India has built strategic relations with Mongolia keeping Chinese influence in mind. Just like China courts India's neighbors, India also courts China's neighbors and builds strategic relations with them. India and Mongolia actually have a very strong defense and security relationship and the joint military exercise that is carried out every year is named as nomadic elephant. Is that clear? So to participate in the exercise, the Indian Air Force has deployed a C-17 Globemaster aircraft which has transported around 43 Indian Army soldiers to take part in these joint military exercises. It's mainly focused on counter-terrorism and they exchange their expertise and practices. It builds interoperability between the two forces. So please remember that Nomadic Elephant is a joint army exercise between Indian, Indian Army and the Mongolian Army. Next, on page 15, we have an article related to the topic of cluster bombs. This topic has been making a lot of news. So I feel it is very relevant for prelims. It's in the context of the Russia-Ukraine war. The United States has recently announced a military aid package to Ukraine where it is looking to supply cluster bombs which is a very very controversial ammunition. So you should know what is a cluster bomb. Why is it controversial? A cluster bomb 
is such a ammunition it's such a type of a weapon which dispenses many smaller ammunitions when it is fired or launched over a certain target area it's not just one rocket or missile which strikes the target before striking it will disperse multiple warheads multiple smaller ammunitions are dispersed in a large area and that whole area is bombed through this cluster bomb that's why it's called a cluster bomb it's a cluster of bombs that disperses over a large area such technique of bombing is also referred to as carpet bombing and this is a highly controversial military weapon and a military tactic because carpet bombing is indiscriminate firing it does not discriminate between the combatants and non-combatants civilians could be targeted civilians could lose their lives as a large area is bombed with cluster of bombs and the other worst part is that many of the bombs they don't detonate since multiple bombs are disposed some of them will explode but some of them will not explode and they remain on the ground this unexploded ordinance is a huge risk in the future civilians even after the war ends many years later decades later civilians can step on it and if the ammunition explodes even then it can kill civilians indiscriminately this is the reason why these are the two reasons why carpet bombing and cluster bombs are banned by most of the countries in fact we have a convention the convention on cluster munitions it's a international treaty signed in 2008 in dublin and it brought it was brought into force in 2010 all right more than 111 countries have ratified it but the big powers like us russia china even india they have not ratified the convention but many countries even european countries have ratified the convention against cluster ammunitions it prohibits the stockpiling development and storage and usage of cluster bombs but us has announced its intention to supply cluster bombs to ukraine to help ukraine in its fight against russia and russia has reacted russian president putin has personally stepped in and warned that russia has massive stockpiles of cluster bombs and it has not used them until now because of humanitarian concerns and global conventions even though it's not a signatory russia has said that we haven't used cluster bombs as of now but if us is triggering us and supplying cluster bombs to ukraine and if ukraine uses them in the battlefield then russia will retaliate by using its cluster ammunition so this proposed deal has been opposed by european partners of us nato allies of us like uk france germany they've all opposed the supply of cluster bombs because they're all signatories to the convention on cluster ammunition all right so please understand what are cluster bombs why is it controversial why is it banned and what is the convention on cluster ammunition next on page 20 we have the science and technology section that refers to the beauty of evolution in nature which adds to biodiversity as you know any organism undergoes evolution where the genetic structure keeps mutating and better and more efficient forms of organisms keep developing and evolving right from microscopic pathogens to mammals to reptiles every organism keeps evolving evolution is the truth of nature it is the right of every life form right this has been conclusively proven as well through various scientific studies and helps us understand how organisms have evolved how uh, our biodiversity has evolved over the years but scientists in 2016 they had created few synthetic bacteria synthetic organisms by using minimal number of genes to see whether they can prevent evolution from happening all right in a lab that created few organisms especially bacteria by using the absolute minimum number of genes that are needed by removing all the unnecessary genes these pathogens will simply survive they'll simply have a life but they thought researchers thought that it will not evolve it can't undergo evolution but to the surprise of everyone these synthetic organisms that were created with minimal genes even they have started undergoing mutations 
they have developed better variants of themselves thus showing that nature is very resilient every organism from a microscopic organism to the largest organisms right they are blessed with the beauty of evolution where the genetic structure keeps mutating and updating itself it keeps accustomizing itself to changing environmental conditions thereby strengthening that organism now this is very very crucial for scientific studies in the field of medicine and pharmaceuticals because it can help us understand the development of antimicrobial resistance the development of super pathogens which can evade immunity and even vaccines and life saving drugs so that is the key development being reported in this article so please understand that evolution is a right of all life forms and even if you create synthetic organisms with minimal number of genes still nature takes over and evolution will be reported genetic mutations will happen because scientists have realized that these organisms that were created with minimal genes even they have come up with better mutations of themselves all right now let's look at the last article in the same page we have an article on coral bleaching and i feel it's very very important for your prelims corals as you know coral reefs they are considered as the top the evergreen forests of the oceans because they they are beaming and they are teeming with biodiversity coral reefs the coral structures they are so diverse and they host so many life forms and they create a unique ecosystem a marine ecosystem that they strengthen marine biodiversity and support many other organisms and life forms so they are referred to as the rainforest the evergreen forests of the oceans so the coral structures here which is essentially made up of calcium and other minerals plays a critical role in our marine ecosystems right these corals if you have ever seen coral reefs they are very beautiful to look at they have very unique structures unique shapes and more importantly they have vibrant colors and where does this color come from the color actually comes from a organism a type of algae known as zooxanthellae corals on their own are white in color because it's largely made up of calcium and other minerals available in the water and the seabed so naturally it is white in color but inside the coral structure there is a symbiotic relationship that you witness these organisms these algae which represents a basic life form in the seas called zooxanthellae they are hosted by the coral structure and they support each other the coral structure has this symbiotic relationship where they mutually help each other all right the zooxanthellae the algae provides amino acids and sugars which is needed for the building up of the coral structure and in return they receive minerals and carbon dioxide from the coral structure that is the symbiotic equation now this equation is getting disturbed because of climate change and global warming and also because of oceanic acidification human induced climate change has warmed the global temperatures has increased the global temperatures so sea surface temperature is increasing ice caps are melting right so there is a change undergoing in the sea sea temperature this affects the coral structure the formation of the structure itself and the algae as well then since more carbon is being released the carbon is being absorbed by the seas and the oceans increasing the carbonization right oceans are a carbon sink so as more carbon sinks into the seas and the oceans it results in acidification of the oceans and higher acidic levels is extremely harmful to the coral structure and also to the algae this symbiotic relationship is getting destroyed and as a result it leads to the bleaching of corals beautiful vibrant colors are going away because the algae is dying out right they are losing their home which is the coral reef itself the coral structure itself because of rising temperatures and oceanic acidification is that clear so that is what you should understand from here but however there are other factors as well which can contribute to bleaching of corals it could be water pollution or any stress level in the ecosystem right any external stress in the ecosystem or even tidal activity 
any unpredictable tidal activity can also result in bleaching of the corals. The corals are losing their vibrant colors because the algae is getting affected and the symbiotic relationship is getting broken. The color is coming from the algae which dwells in the coral structure. So please understand the role of global warming and acidification of the oceans in pushing bleaching of corals. The last point I would like to make is that this can be reversed if the ecosystem is protected. Right? There have been places where bleached corals have got back their color because the algae forms have come back to reside in the coral structures. We have seen this happen in Japan's Irio Moat Island in 2016. Right? At this island in Japan, corals had been bleached, it had turned white. But we have seen a recovery in the last few years where the algae has come back and it has added the vibrant colors back to the coral reefs. So these are some key points that you need to note down for your prelims. With this, I complete my detailed discussion of today's newspaper. I hope you guys have liked it. Please take up these questions for your mains answer writing practice. And also head to the Telegram channel because we have a quiz on these topics. You can revise them again by attempting these questions. So let me know how the session went through your comments. Share the video with other aspirants as well and do press the like button. That is it from my side. Thanks for watching. I'll see you tomorrow. Have a good day.